Hello and welcome to the Latvian Movie Guide, a place to better understand what's going on on the screen. In this video, I'll be covering the first big Latvian movie, The Bass Layer, that came out in 1930. It is the only surviving Latvian film of the silent era, and although 90 years ago this type of cinema was already going out of fashion, being replaced by films with sound, it was a success, mostly because until then no Latvian movie had been made at this scale and also because it was made to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Latvia as an independent nation. Obviously it was a great dose of patriotism right into the pride of being Latvian, so no one could say no to that. Plus, the plot was easy to follow, the best layer tells the age-old story of good versus evil, the good ones being the Latvian national heroes, while the forces of evil are represented mostly by Germans. In the movie, the story of animosity between the two nations transcends time, following the thread of history emerging in the Middle Ages and exploding in the full bloom in the Latvian War of Independence in 1919. In Bersley, the patriotic vibes are strong, and there are no great characters or controversy to play with. The evil is evil, and the good is good, so it does not require much mental labor from the viewer. For most of the actors, it was their debut on the big screen, for the simple reason that they were not actors at all, and never got their second chance in front of the camera. And since we're talking about the actors, what is unique about this movie is that many of the historical figures portrayed here did really participate in making the film, playing themselves. Well, that's authenticity, you cannot say that about history movies today. Welcome to the world of the Baslayev. What is the best piece of bait any director of any movie can throw at their audience? A love story. Works every time. The best layer was no different, even more generous than an average movie, because it offers not one, but two love stories. First one being that of Bessley and Leimbut in the High Middle Ages, when the German crusaders had only started to arrive to the lands of the Baltic tribes. Although the history in the background is real, the characters themselves are fictional and come from the epic poem that goes by the same name, the Bessleyer. The legendary work was written in 1888 by Andreis Pumpurs, who sensed that the Latvian mythology lacked the crown jewel that other nations did have. Finns had Kalevala, Estonians Kalevipoeg. Pumpers drew inspiration from them and also the local mythology, and the best layer was born. The author did not waste any time at all, and right from the first pages started delivering heavy blows of magic left and right. The main hero is born as a man-bear hybrid. Well, to be honest, visually there is nothing much that makes him stand out in the crowd, of course apart from a couple of ears he inherited from his bear mother. Well, there's also the awesome strength that comes with his ears, so great that he was able to rip up an entire bear. That's why the name. However, terrorizing the forest population is not why he's here. Besley has a higher purpose. He is the one. His job is to fight the dark forces, witches and giants and devils and also Germans, which fall in the same category as far as you ask any Latvian in the 19th century. So while he's doing all of that, a love story unfolds between him and Leimdut. That's basically the plot of the poem. Now, how faithful is the movie to the original epic? It is shamelessly cheating, sleeping with any new idea it can put its hands on. The whole plotline of the Tsar, the Black Knight feels for Limedot, is a pure artistic liberty. The same goes for the Bersley's attack on the castle and all those shenanigans around the brooch. However, this addition is understandable since in the movie the Black Knight symbolizes the German crusaders having taken Leimdun hostage, who in turn is the symbol of Latvia. The Bersley comes to rescue her and in the end gets into a duel with the Black Knight, which at the moment seems more like competition between an overly expressive painter and an emotional orchestra conductor. A duel between these two does really take place in the poem. Anyway, in the process Kangars is killed, the lackey of the Black Knight and the traitor of all Latvians, whose name has turned into a noun in the Latvian language used to describe traitors of any kind. The first part of the movie ends in the uncertainty of the winner of the duel, which cannot be said about the poem, where both opponents die drowning in the river Daugava. From the mythical realm, the movie sails into the stormy reality of 1905. The scene opens with a young man, Jan Svanax, reading the poem Bersleje, thus connecting the ancient past with the 20th century. His shameless slacking at work is interrupted by members of the punitive expedition. They are here for a reason, and Jan knows that. The year of 1905 was 
different. In Latvia, it is known as the crazy year. Well, it was turbulent throughout the entire Russian Empire. It started in St. Petersburg in January, where soldiers opened fire on a peaceful demonstration, killing many. Right after that, the protests and strikes floated through the vast empire and also spilled into the Latvian territory, where the flames burned hotter than anywhere else, because Latvians had plenty of reasons for a revolt, brewing for a long time. In the countryside, they were not happy about the church and land being in the lands of the German nobility, with all their privileges and tax exemptions. In the cities, many wanted to change the poor state of factory workers, as no trade unions were allowed to exist. Another reason was the total fiasco in the Russian-Japanese war in the Far East. The locals were strongly against the conscription in a war a world away, so the protests and strikes spread all over the Latvian territory. The stone castles of the Crusaders, now manors of the German nobility, were burned down. Desperate pleas for help from the German ruling class reached St. Petersburg, and they were answered. The first units of the punitive expedition arrived in mid-December, which is why the year mentioned in the movie 1905 is not entirely correct. It should be 1906, because it would be impossible to lay in the grass casually flipping to a book in the middle of December. There's a saying that 1906 was even crazier than 1905. Long story short, it was not very fun. The Punishers did not waste time. Whenever they stumbled upon a place that had seen some action during the previous months, they fired a barrage from their cannons and then entered the town. They gathered the heads of the community and the people, and executions were carried out. In January alone, 1,200 people were shot without trial. Houses were burned. People were tortured and maimed in prisons, mostly to simply intimidate the masses. So after all of that, Janus Vanek sees another unit of Punishers approaching, looking for a man named Saulitz. Thanks to his warning, Saulitz gets away in time, but Janus Vanek gets punished. This only cements his hate toward Germans. So, was Janus Vanek a notable hero of 905? The history is silent on this one, so it looks like the name of the hero was simply randomly chosen. The next scene takes us to the battlefields of World War I. Here, the animosity between the Latvians and Germans have turned into the bloodiest conflict of the history. In this part of the movie, dedicated to the Great War, Janis Vanek serves as the guide for the audience visiting the most important battlefields of this conflict. We also have a quick shot of a badge that's barely visible, but very symbolic. It is the badge, or to be more precise, one of the badges Latvian soldiers had in this war. It was a distinctive element that set them apart from the rest of the Russian army. After all, it's a patriotic movie, so why not mix in another national symbol? We are united with Janis Vanex, who no longer is a boy, but a man, serving in the Latvian battalions in the Russian army. Also, for a brief moment, we are introduced to the famous Colonel Briedis, still a captain here in the stage of war presented in the movie, who was one of the greatest Latvian soldiers ever. He turned into a legend while he was still alive for his courageous feats in the battlefield and surprised everyone with the record fast rise in the military ranks, and also with the fact that he received all the possible decorations before the age of 30. Briedis instructs Janis Vanex to deliver a message to Colonel Janis Francis at the Death Island. Although this sounds more like something from the poem Bear this is a real place. In 1915, as the Germans advanced, most of the Russian army retreated to the north bank of the river Daugava. However, some units had left on the other side and literally dug themselves in the ground in this only two square kilometer large area. Latvians here were surrounded by German forces on three sides, with their backs against the river Daugava, thus being trapped like on an island and it turned into the Death Island, because they were outnumbered and constantly shelled day and night, which produced heavy losses, and constant shipments of crosses to St. George. Next, we have a brief scene at the Machine Gun Hill that has, too, acquired a mythical aura. It was a heavily fortified German position during the war that was courageously taken by Latvian forces during the legendary Christmas battles in late December 1916. The last part of the movie tells us the story of the Latvian War of Independence. Sort of. Because the history is peppered with all kinds of events, and no audience has time for that. So, what happened here? 
This war followed right after World War I and started with the proclamation of independence of Latvia on 18 November 1918, which you can see in the movie, and right after that the provisional government was formed. However, this happy moment turned sour very quickly, as two weeks later the Red Army invaded Latvia and established a communist government. Because why not? After the Great War, communist ideas were fashionable and Latvia was no exception. The provisional government had to flee to Liepāja, because they had no army, yet. Here, from the demobilized soldiers of the German 8th Army and barely any Latvians, they formed a makeshift fighting force to start taking back the lost territory. Sounds great. What could go wrong? Well, having the military made of almost exclusively Germans is probably not the best situation. But more about that later. In the meantime, re experienced hard times under the communist occupation. People were selling whatever they had left to have money for food, while others were in prison for being anti-communist or just because it's Mir's dad who is too inconvenient. Meanwhile in the north, the Northern Army of Latvia, faithful to the provisional Latvian government, was formed to open a second front against the communists. We also see an Estonian army representative. This is to pay tribute to the Estonians who played a crucial role in this. So the two Latvian allied armies started to take back territory from the communists, each fighting on their own front. And they were quite successful at that. Too good to be true, right? Exactly. Let's get back to the tricky situation when you're a Latvian government, but most of your soldiers are Germans. Well, this overwhelming military power gave Germans too many fantastic ideas. So they decided that before taking Riga, it would be a good idea to change the government they were fighting for. So they tried to arrest the Latvian provisional government and establish their own pro-German one. It is represented in the movie by a brief scene with Janis Vanex and Liepai witnessing German plotting. They succeeded. Well, partially, as most of the Latvian cabinet pulled the Assange maneuver by hiding in the British embassy. If you think about running all that, I promise you, you're not going to make it. All right, I'm a lot faster than you think. Later, they moved to a ship nearby under the protection of the British fleet. So, 1919 was a big year for governments. Latvia had three at the same time, and each with their own army and territory they controlled. So, obviously, Germans didn't like the Northern Army's push towards Riga, so they turned against them instead of fighting the communists. The Battle of Cesis, where the both armies met, although only briefly mentioned in the movie, was the first major confrontation between the Latvian and German forces in the War of Independence. Long story short, Germans lost, and the Western Allies ordered them to go home to Germany. Then we have a long scene of the Latvian Northern Army entering Riga. For this, the armed forces lent to the film crew 500 of its soldiers. The army rides through the Alexander Ark, which is still the only triumphal arc in Latvia. Originally, it was built for another army and for another victory, 100 years earlier, when the Russians defeated Napoleon. But back to the action. Now we are introduced to the last important, but certainly the most delusional player of this war, a Russian officer, Pavel Bermond Avalov. He was crucial for the Germans who did not want to go home. In order to deceive everyone, they got under Bermond's wing, who was supposed to lead them in the fight against the communists in the Russian Civil War. He never did. This way, Germans found a pretext to stay in Latvia. Although Bermont was a real adventurer suffering from megalomania with dreams of becoming the next Tsar of Russia, he never had plans of conquering the West too, as shown in the movie. So in the end, Bermont's German army attacked Riga, where they were defeated, then retreated to Jalgava, and in the end had to leave Latvia with nothing. Laimdota and later Mirza, who obviously inherits her spirit, like base layer is reborn in Janis Vanex, is portrayed as a strong woman. However, she has her one weakness, as all heroes do. It is her brooch. It seems to have some kind of power over her. That's why the Black Knight wants to put a spell on it, trusting that it would break Laimdota's spirit. But uh, how much magic power does a brooch really hold in Latvian culture? Not much. Well, certainly not as much as the director wants us to believe. What it once did hold was the social power. Brooches like any other jewelry were connected to wealth and social standing. The more sophisticated, more expensive and beautiful the piece, the better. However, in comparison to all the other accessories, the brooch 
had a special place. It was the centerpiece of a person's attire and pride of its owner. And not only because of its size and location, but also for the simple reason that people did not have buttons back then and the brooch hold the clothing together. So it had a practical aspect as well. Due to this important role, over time it also acquired a lot of symbolic value. For example, instead of an engagement ring, a girl received a special engagement brooch from her boyfriend. It was also a symbol of femininity, fertility, and even had a say in your faith. They believed that if a brooch, especially an engagement brooch, broke, it was a bad sign, even an omen of approaching death. So, probably because of all this cultural and symbolic weight, exactly the brooch, and no other piece of jewelry, like a ring, a bracelet, a necklace, or a crown, was chosen to hold the ultimate power in the movie. The director added to it a special value that none of the players of the story had. It is the guarantee of the freedom of Latvia. That's why Mirz and Leimdut, incarnation of Latvia, need it so much and cannot live without it. The best layer had its premiere on the big screen in March 1930. The big moment was honored by all the most important government officials, like the president, prime minister, head of the parliament, and others. Massive crowds filled the streets around the cinema with the unlucky ones who had not got the tickets. The movie did not have a serious budget, not even for a movie in 1930. In today's money, it would be close to one million dollars. One fourth of this amount was covered by the government. A lot of heavy lifting was done by the Ministry of Defense, who supplied not only a literal army of extras, but also money, costumes, and materials. There wasn't even any money for salaries, so almost all the actors did it for free. Well, it doesn't sound that bad when you consider the fact that almost none of them were real actors. The only professional in the whole cast was an actress of Dial's theater, Lilita Berzin, who played Lime Dot and Mirza. She was the only member of the cast who kept starring in plays and movies afterwards. She was also the only one who got heavily criticized for her acting. The critics said that it was too forced, too theatrical. And according to them, also her natural looks didn't quite match the role. While the actress bore the brunt of the criticism, the press found weak spots in the work of the rest of the cast as well. For example, they said that Kangars did not really match the Latvian idea of a trailer, as in the movie he was portrayed more like a clown and not as the more serious and sinister version of the poem. Also, they said that it was not enough to simply make faces and put in a monocle to play the evil German. At the same time, there was some praise in a completely unexpected direction. Karl Sulmans, who, along a large number of other politicians, played himself in the proclamation scene, was praised for his work as the best actor. They said that actors should learn from him, that he has a bright acting future ahead of him, and that he cannot imagine the fame he might have in the future. Well, they were wrong about the acting, but right about the fame, because in 1934 he staged a coup and became the dictator of Latvia. The rest of the cast were people from all walks of life. For example, the actor of the Bass Slayer, Janis Vanax, was a Navy pilot, while Mirza's father worked at a cigarette factory. Of course, there was criticism about too many useless battlefield scenes and the lack of other historical figures and moments, but as they used to say, when any two witnesses of the Latvian independence story meet after the movie, they always agree on one thing, that two moments have been left out, exactly those moments they have witnessed themselves. So in Latvia, the movie was a great success. How about other countries? How did the world react to the first ever Latvian blockbuster? First, the movie was shown in Lithuania and Estonia. The Estonians were furious because they were shocked about the lack of their depiction in the movie. And one of the army generals even prohibited soldiers from watching it. It's understandable, as the Estonians played a crucial role in defeating the Germans. In the movie, Estonians are represented only by some representative of the Estonian army. In 1931, it was shown in Czechoslovakia, under a different title though, Heroes of the Nation. Obviously, in Czechoslovakia, the best play was not known as much as in Latvia. Also, the French were interested in buying the movie, but they had one condition, that it should be made into a sound movie first, something that the poor Latvian movie industry simply was not ready for. The silent film era was over, so the Bayslayer did not enter the world movie arena.
To this very day, the Bass Layer remains the only movie covering so much of the Latvian national struggle. It is rich in history, not only because it shows real historical people playing themselves, like politicians and veterans of the War of Independence, but it also incorporates real historical footage, like the visit by the German Kaiser. It also holds the crown as the oldest surviving Latvian movie, and the first of this length and ambition. It is history itself. Well, that wraps it up. Thank you for watching the Latvian Movie Guide. Till next time.